And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Horse Lick Review Episode 10. Is it 10? It is 10. All right. Oh, yeah, real quick, man. Uh, correction on that one story. I think I said that the fault line in Iceland wouldn't have been acted when or active when the Norse founded it. But if I if it hasn't been active in a thousand years, then I'm pretty sure the Norse would have founded it by then. Probably. It, it was within the time period. It probably was active, but dying. But anyway, but yeah, <laughs> what fucking story are we going with first? You I don't got know. One, what do you want to start? It looks with? like you got one pulled up, so go with it. I got one pulled up here, and it is um, from uh, I wrote this from NPR, and uh, mummified monkeys remains were found in luggage luggage at Boston's airport. And apparently, um, traveler at Boston Logan International said the bag contained dried fish. But upon further examination, airport agents discovered that it was in fact mummified remains, which included heads belonging to four monkeys, U.S. Customs and Border Protection said in a statement. How do they know they weren't fucking just dried fish monkeys? Mummy fish monkeys. Yeah, we were just talking about those. Like, like, was that last episode or the one before? (laughs) The the mermaid fish, the mermaid monkey fish or whatever. This was was reported on February 12th. So, and then the incident took place on Thursday at a security screening for passengers. A canine officer named Buddy sniffed out the dead and dehydrated monkeys from inside the luggage, belonging to a traveler who recently returned to the U.S. from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So he stole mummified monkey remains from Congo. Why did they have mummified monkey remains to begin with? <laughs> and it says here that raw or minimally processed meat from certain ant- wild animals, otherwise known as bush meat, is not allowed to enter the U.S. largely out of health concerns. So that's why he got in a bunch of trouble. I like to eat a So lot. it probably wasn't illegal for him to have the mummified remains, like in the Congo, probably, yeah. where he was at. But bringing them with him on the plane to the U.S. was breaking yeah. uh, processed... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Bush meat laws. I like you can't to, have that bush meat. I like to eat a lot of bush meat. Me too. And usually, you know, like my girlfriend can take it on planes and there's no problem. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know. I don't feel like, I feel like this is, uh, it's kind of wrong. You should be able to take any, all the bush meat you want onto a plane. Oh God. Eight pounds of bush meat this guy had in his oh, bag. Oh wow, that's chunky. The Centers for Disease Control marked it for destruction. So they probably like incinerated it or something. It says airport agents around the country have encountered a variety of meats. In 2022, <laughs> agents at Washington Dole's airport confiscated charred bat. And in 2019, officers at O'Hare International Airport intercepted about 32 pounds of rat meat. So people, so this is a very regular thing, uh, apparently, that all kinds of people are trying to sneak in bush meat. <laughs> All the time. Bush meat needs to be like a punk rock band, dude. But the picture is very uh, interesting. Like, he had it, like, wrapped up in, like, what looks like tissue paper and then, like, or a blanket. Some kind of little, like... Uh, it's Part of that looks like a fast food thing. wrapper. Yeah, like and then, for... like, tissue paper and old cardboard. Yeah. And then, then this looks like a part of, like, an old basket. It's like an old bas- woven basket Yeah, part. but the paper that's sticking out looks like it's from, like, a... Local taco chain why or something. Would you, what I want to know is, is why would you want this? Like, well, what why, are you going to do with these mummified monkey parts? Yeah, like, I don't, sit them I don't on know. your mantle for display. I don't know, man. Maybe like sell them to an audio, like an oddities show or something. Maybe. Like, how many oddities shows are there around? I do. I this dude got flew this in in like nineteen twenty nine. Yeah, he probably makes some money. I mean, I, I just went to, like, a Oddities and Curiosity show a couple of weekends ago. It's all, like, taxidermy. Where at? Louisville. It was, like, all taxidermy and just weird shit. Like, I I ended up getting some leather gauntlets from it. Uh, a Krampus, like, wooden carved Christmas ornament. Nice. And then, uh, I don't know, some other bullshit. But, I mean, there was, like, a lot of weird shit, like taxidermy bones and stuff like you know beaver skulls cat skulls fucking weird tails and shit 
old taxidermied animals. Yeah, they had old ta- and new, freshly taxidermied animals, and you could buy bones and stuff. Oh man, if I'd had a lot more money too, they had like signs painted that were pretty cool. Like they had a Camp Crystal Lake, like like taxidermied like pets or taxidermied like wild animals. Wild animals mostly, but again, there was like domestic cat skulls and stuff you could get. I was pretty. Well, I was just wondering the actual like taxidermied stuffed animals. Yeah, like, let me see if I can find. Like I, I had a I had a step grandfather. I remember when I was a kid. Yeah. He had a whole room. There was a bed in there, and I was probably you know I was very young. I have some memories. I can remember when I was like two and three. So I was probably around three years old, maybe going on four. And that's where I would go to like take my naps or sleep at night. And he, it was the extra room in their house. And he had taxidermied bobcats and like raccoons and like birds and like all this shit just in this room. And it's all just like staring at me. And I remember being like, probably caused, caused some sort of trauma, wouldn't you think? <laughs> Maybe. Like, <laughs> it freaked me out, dude. Like, yeah, it was the. Oddities and Curiosities Expo. Right here, let me take a little fucking picture and shit. Oh, cool. We'll have to check that out sometime. Let's see if we... Oh, yeah, there's a picture of some of the cat skulls and shit. Huh. But there's more. You can get a beaver skull and all kinds of shit. Nice. What kind of, uh... What's your next story here? Uh... Let's see. I guess keeping with the animal theme, but alive. Sea otters, once hunted to near extinction, are preventing coastal erosion as their populations grow, studies find. Study finds. This is from ABC News. Sea otters are proving to be the mother, to be mother nature's solution to the prevention of coastal erosion and re- a recent discovery that further demonstrates how conservation efforts can help to restore an ecosystem as a whole. Sea otters were nearly hunted to extinction in the 18th and 19th centuries for their pelts. But as populations begin to recover in California after decades of conservation efforts there, the marine mammals are helping to fortify the environment as they expand their range, according to a paper published in the Journal of Nature on Wednesday. So apparently, they're known for having a big appetite. They're uh, eating a lot of the burrowing crabs that have been eroding the salt marshes in uh, California. Uh near a coastal area of Elkhorn Slough on Monterey Bay. Uh, but they're having a big impact on the protection of seagrasses. And uh, I guess apparently with the, the absence of sea otters, the crabs, the, the crabs had kind of like taken over and they've been, you know, destabilizing the shoreline, create like it says, quote, creating a Swiss cheese consistency in the soil, which yeah. then causes the marsh to slump off or erode into the water. Nice. When that happens, it's gone for good. But they've reintroduced like sea otters. So the probably- sea otters have redeemed themselves because you remember we had that. Oh, story yeah, they were attacking. The attack. That's true. So they, they did a face like turn. mauled someone. Yeah. Well, uh, now they're mauling fucking crabs, good. burrowing crabs. Like they've been able to consume enough of the crabs to slow the erosion to a halt. So essentially, like you know, you can't bring it back. But now it's like the ecosystem has stabilized itself. So now the erosion, like they're not losing anything essentially. But that's, that's uh, awesome. Now it does say that it's considered a temporary solution to coastal erosion. Uh, and it it says the bigger thing would be prevention of threats such as sea level rise, pollution, hydrology changes that'll which will take more time but have a larger impact. Which yeah, obviously you still need to stop pollution, but yeah, you know, like this is still cool, especially if it's halted it. I guess it couldn't halt it permanently though, with more pollution, more hydrology changes, and things like that. But uh, so as long as the sea otters hang around, yeah, it'll help at the very least. But uh. It says most ecologists maintain that we need to reduce the stressors, which no fucking duh. Uh, and let's see. Prior to recent decades, it wasn't known that sea otters live amid the salt marsh. See, I guess they didn't even know. Yeah, I forgot because I've read this previously, but they didn't even know that they lived in the salt marshes. They're te- they're typically seen in kelp forests farther out to sea. Uh, Hughes said, which is one of the researchers, but because they took to the coastal environment as if they had been living there for thousands of years, the researchers hypothesized that the otters could be returning to what they may, what may have been their natural habitat before they were hunted for their pelts. And, and they're finally like, oh shit, we can go back home. Yeah. People aren't using us to make, 
Yeah. I think essentially that's what it was is like there's been enough generations since conservation <laughs> efforts that we're not perceived as the threat that we once were. He just reminded me of something completely off topic, but yeah. it kind of is the pelts is I just saw this like article, this small article about, you know, was it Frank Lucas? Remember him? The biggest drug dealer in the like the seventies okay. in New York. And like he was virtually, virtually unknown. The police didn't know anything about him. Okay. Until he showed up to a Muhammad Ali boxing match wearing a full body length chinchilla <laughs> fur coat and hat and he had seats better seats than diana ross and frank sinatra and so the cops were like what the hell who's this guy and he said it was like the biggest mistake he ever made <laughs> so that's what they reminded me of that like hey i mean that's that's pretty much it for this story just saw this coat <laughs> <laughs> except for uh you know the only thing it basically says after that is why they were hunted between the 1700s and 1800s for their for their pelts because they made well, coats and shoes and well, yeah, bags. But, and Yeah, well, it's because, here's the quote, they have around a million hair follicles per square inch, which means they're really, really soft, end quote. If you ever touch a sea otter pelt, you can understand why it was a prized possession in the 18th and 19th centuries. But, uh, you know, they gained protections and... In the uh, International Fur Seal Treaty of 1911, received additional safeguarding with the passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972 and the Endangered Species Act the year later. And then it, you know, it says sea otters are a prime example of, <laughs> this is another fucking duh, but uh, sea otters are a prime example of how conservation efforts for a particular species can have a domino effect on restoring and preserving the ecosystem as a whole, the research shows. <laughs> It's like, yeah. oh, you think the thing that's been there and, like, keeping shit in check? Probably should have been there for hundreds of years. About a hundred years now. And yeah. been gone. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Over a <laughs> hundred years, yeah. But, like, stuff like that. And this not so much, because, I mean, I guess they could look at otters and be like, damn, that's some nice fur. Let's make something out of those guys. Uh -huh. But, like, some of the stuff you see, like, that all, human beings have done over the years using certain animals a certain way or eating this or eating that it's like how much like one how much trial and error no. and then two some of them it's like how'd they even figure that at all at all out at all like puffer fish highly poisonous uh, oh eating it yeah unless you fillet it this perfect way yeah I, when the first motherfucker dropped dead who thought you know, I bet if I cut that bitch, I think I need to do a finer cut. Yeah, if I cut that bitch just a little bit better. Yeah. Well, who the thought? Who the fuck thought? You know, if I melt this horse down, I can stick shit to shit. Yeah, I can use. <laughs> I can stick stuff to shit. Yeah, I can use it to stick things, and I can make delicious fruity candy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but uh, okay, my next one is this. Uh, this one's kind of. Uh, it, it was funny to me, and I'll tell you why once I read it. But um. Is a reversal from the Guinness Book of World Records. Apparently, um, uh -oh. Richard Plod had um, taken years to create the largest um, replica of the Eiffel Tower out of matchsticks. It took 700,000 matchsticks. Okay. And they had originally um, denied him, saying uh, that he'd broken some kind of rules. Uh, it said Richard Plot, a Frenchman who had, who's, who has dreamed of building the world's tallest matchstick sculpture, made headlines this week. This is from NPR. When Guinness World Records rejected his huge model of the Eiffel Tower, saying Plod, or however you say this, I might be saying his name wrong, broke the rules. I think it's Plod. I think you're right. It hurt me, <laughs> he told uh, TF1 French TV News. News outlets reported on his disappointment that his work was rejected. But after an official review, it seems that we have been heavy-handed in the application of our rules in this case. Guinness World Records Director of Central Records Services, Mark McKinley, said in an email to NPR as Guinness announced the reversal. So, the one 45th scale model stands 7.19 meters, a little taller than 23 and a half feet, and it took him years and more than 700,000 matchsticks to build the finely detailed structure 
Um, finally, last month, he unveiled his finished result to thousands of people and his followers on Instagram. So I guess he had been, like, tracking his progress on Instagram, which is smart. Like, it gains a lot of... He could probably be making money, too. I don't know. I don't know exactly how everything works on Instagram that way. But uh, but what I found funny about this is... is I don't see what... Why they rejected it to begin with? But lacked... Oh, why? Here it is. Um, said the materials Plod used was too different from standard Mac sticks you can buy in a store. Mm. At issue... Well, the issue was his decision to go straight to a French matchstick company and arrange for a shipment of sticks that were evidently fairly standard but lacked the match's normal flammable tip. Okay, it's dumb. It's a yeah. matchstick. Yeah. Okay, but they're still matchsticks. It's just you can't set them on fire and burn his Eiffel Tower down. <laughs> yeah. Um, your sculpture. But this wasn't, is a funny Your thing sculpture kills, wasn't dangerous enough. That, yeah, and the thing that kills me about this is is one really recent example with when we were talking about all the Billy Mitchell stuff and whatever uh, that other asshole's name is. I can't remember his name. That's falsified. Tons yeah. of video game records who's like stuck up Billy Mitchell's ass. Um, the Guinness record just took records, just took their shit as, as truth. I mean, just put it in there. Well, like, you know what I mean? Like didn't send a guy to like, yeah, that's fucking dumb. I mean, they had to, I think weren't all his stuff. Wasn't all his stuff finally removed from the Guinness. I mean, I know it was removed from galaxy or whatever. So you, you would assume that, <laughs> Guinness would follow suit, especially if they followed suit without any sort of like you know checks and balances. Yeah, well, I just think it's it is cool that at least they went back and overturned their decision because this dude obviously he worked, yeah. worked his ass off for years. I mean, and it's it's yeah, it I mean it good. is an exact replica. Like it looks nice, man. So, um, yeah, I thought it was just a cool story and funny that. The Guinness Book of World Records, like, were being that like picky. When you see other stuff that they look, it just yeah. looks like they just they just throw it in there, and just give the person the record. Yeah, sure, dude. You fucked the most watermelons in the in the in a twenty four hour period. Yeah, I still hold that record. <laughs> you see right here, he three hundred and sixty two and a half watermelons. <laughs> you see right here, he clipped the footage. He clipped the footage. <laughs> 364. I think it's more like 286. <laughs> what do you got next? His penis couldn't have maintained two messins. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've got from the mirror.co.uk. Woman has sex with ghost every night for 20 years, but dumps him over his fangs. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> what? After a, after a two... Hey, I'll just... I'm going to read this word for word, dude. <laughs> After a two-decade-long passionate fling, a woman has admitted to dumping her ghost lover after she saw his terrifying face and doesn't want him to contact her again. A woman has claimed she's been sleeping with a ghost for 20 years, but the relationship turned sour when she caught a glimpse of the ghoul's terrifying face. Paola Flores says her relationship with the ghost started when she was younger and led to two decades of passionate nights together. She even went as far as to claim that the spirit always initiated it. Despite falling in love with the supernatural soul, the pairing soon turned cold when the woman saw the ghost's face, describing him as a large male figure, quote, with fangs in the face of a gargoyle. Paola then decided she didn't want to contact, she didn't want any contact with him again. How do you cut, how exactly do you just cut off contact with the ghost? I don't know, man, but you know, for twenty years, busting made her feel good. And I just want to, <laughs> I just want to say, I've known a person in my lifetime named Paola. Yeah, and she was crazy as hell too. Maybe it had something to do with that name. <laughs> was she also from Colombia? Because the woman from Colombia shared her romance on the TV show no. Sin Carreta on the state-owned channel Canal One, where she explained to the show's host Juan Diego Alvira how the relationship started. Quote, 
One day I was lying down when I felt a hand move from my feet to my chest, and it was strange. I was scared. From that moment on, he started coming to me like a spirit to have sex with me, she claimed. <laughs> she admitted to enjoying their steamy sessions every night until she got a glimpse of his face, she added. Quote, the last time I saw his face was when I didn't want to continue. Psychologist Martiza Montileri, I butchering that name, claims Flores' case is not not at all common. <laughs> really, you think? Adding, in fact, demonic cases <laughs> are extremely isolated. However, parapsychologist Wairo Urbex believes Flores' account is credible, adding that she was probably in a relationship with an incubus, which is the male version of a succubus, for those that don't know. Yeah, this guy saying that that's... That just uh, that statement is he, he just wants to write a book about it. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> Urbex explained an incubus is a demonic entity. It is a lower astral entity. They specialize in grabbing people and taking their energy. Grabbing them and taking it. Yeah. Oh, I'm fueled by your cums. <laughs> That wasn't in the article. Uh, people were quick to chime on, chime in on Paola's experience. As one local commented, it must have been a satanic spirit, while another jibed. Tell her it was a neighbor with, with a sheet with holes. <laughs> That's very good. Meanwhile, another person joked, that spirit was no saint. And, oh, fuck, I guess the article. And then a, the article <laughs> abruptly ends. Abruptly ends with that... With the, <laughs> I don't know, man. But the neighbor's statements. Uh, it just reminds me. There was a really a show. What was that show about the succubus on Sci-Fi Channel? Oh, was it Saint Center? No, no, like no. the movie, the no. Sci-Fi Channel movie. I fucking love Saint Center. No, no, no. This was a show. It went on for several seasons. It was something girl. Oh, I don't know, man. That show was that was a good show. It was fun. She like, it was like these people called the Fae, and like there were all these different types of like. So they were like from the fairy realm or some shit. Well, there they were, were fairy there beings? were fae. Yeah, like there's all the every type of like mythological type of thing. Yeah, w there was in this, but the main character. So oh, was the it was statement? Called, it was called something girl. What was it called? But she, the main character, was she was a succubus. Yeah, and then like they were like there was one where she like fought against a like dealt with a kappa. And like, oh, like there was the, the Japanese one. spirit that like sucks your butthole. No, the cap is the one that's like a weird little turtle guy. Yeah, doesn't like he kill like suck kids, kill kids and pull them in a river? Yeah, but I thought he like sucked your butthole. I, he might. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I <don't>, <laughs> <laughs> he's never sucked my butthole. But I think it's I think it's either something with your feet or sucking your asshole. But then, then she did the then there she even encountered the one. Um, what is the one that's called that has like the hole in its head and it's like a vessel. I can't think of it. Oh, name. and like, because I had a buddy I worked with years ago who had this whole, compared to this spirit, it's like, I think it was a Japanese thing. Um, But he was talking about how, like, this cool theory about how uh, Jason Voorhees could be one of those. Because oh, yeah. they all have, like, some kind of vessel and it, like, and it was like, he was talking about how his mask with the holes could be that. Yeah. And he could be one of those spirits. And I was like, man, that's a really cool theory. Because, like, and it was like one of the first times I'd heard about that mythological type of being, demon, whatever creature. Oh, I can't anyway, think I <laughs> Yeah, like where they're on an, I can't remember what they're called, but yeah, they base, it's basically like an object and you can get rid of them with like one of those seals or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, or breaking it if you yeah, break their, yeah, break the their object, vessel. Like or whatever. the anchor or whatever. Yeah. I don't know the exact name though. All right. Well, what you got next, man? One I've got next comes from AP. Associated Press, and uh, I don't associate with them. I don't either. I just read their. I just read their articles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it says, uh, "This is what happened when a Cold War era missile was found in the garage of someone's home, and it was, <laughs> and it was a, it was a nice one too. You see the picture here, um, an inert rocket of the type." used to carry a nuclear warhead has been found in the garage of a home of a deceased resident in Washington State. Bellevue police responded Thursday to a report of a military-grade rocket in the garage of a home in the city across Lake Washington from Seattle. 
Police said an Air Force museum in Dayton, Ohio, had called Wednesday evening to report an offer to donate the item, which a neighbor said he had purchased at an estate sale. So, <laughs> how do you buy... How are you allowed to even... Is it because it doesn't have the warhead on it? Like, is it, are you allowed to own these? I, I don't know, man. Mob squad member, bomb squad members inspected the rusting object and found it was a Douglas Air 2 Genie, previously designated MB-1, an unguided air-to-air -air rocket that is designed to carry a 1.2, I mean a 1.5 KTW-25 nuclear warhead. There was no warhead attached. And there was no rocket fuel, essentially meaning that the item was an, an artifact with no explosive hazard. Okay, so that's probably how the person legally was holding on to it and all. You know, because I've read the stories and seen the stories where, like, yeah, people find, like, a bomb buried in the ground. You know what I mean? Like, like in yeah, other and, countries, and usually. And sometimes it's fucking active. Yeah, like, it explodes. They have people come in and, like, carefully dig it out and they take it away and... But, um, so, because the item was inert, the military did not request it back. Police left the item with the neighbor to be restored for display in a museum. So, apparently, I'm assuming this person who passed away, since the neighbor has it, I guess he had no relatives for his things to go to? Because this this neighbor is taken in his, um, the Air Force Armament Museum Foundation has offered him... I guess to buy it or to put it in the museum. But whoever this guy was, sounds like he was pretty interesting. I'd like to know what else was in his home. His neighbors, I guess, got <laughs> his neighbors just got to go in and just take. But this thing is huge, dude. It's like, how big do you think it is compared to that guy right there? And it's strapped to this. It's seven feet long, probably. Or maybe more. Maybe ten. Ten. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could sleep inside it. You could. Easily. I wonder if it would irradiate you, though. Like, yeah, it was inactive, but I wonder, like, how... If yeah, I, I wonder how much, like, residual... Because yeah. that lasts forever. Pretty much. Yeah, sorry it was quiet, man. I was trying to find my other article, and it was not letting me find it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so I had one about ghost sex, but now I have one about ghost divorce. Okay, let's hear. So This is, one, also from the mirror.co.uk. I so, divorced my ghost husband. Now he's stalking me in bizarre disguises. <laughs> this is from who? What is this from? <laughs> the mirror. I have one from the mirror. That's weird. This is like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> brocared. Is this in Columbia as well? No, no, no. I think this is. I can't. I believe this is uh, either in the UK or France. <laughs> it's been a while since I've read this, but uh, yeah. Brocard says she caught her ex, her her ghost ex Eduardo, stalking her in Paris when he claimed to be a dead Frenchman and followed her home. Now wants to date the living. A woman who divorced her <laughs> ghost lover claims the specter is now stalking her after their breakup. Singer-songwriter Brocard from Oxfordshire fell in love with Eduardo, the ghost of a Victorian soldier, in late 2021 when he appeared in her home. A year after she her year after she said they got married, she called quits on the relationship and accused the spirit of cheating on her. <laughs> she called in an exorcist and, and was convinced Eduardo was gone for, for good, so treated herself to a trip to France, where she says she met another ghost named Fabienne near the Eiffel Tower. When it followed her home, she became suspicious, and her worst fears were later confirmed. It was Eduardo in disguise. <laughs> Brocard said, I thought that I'd started a new ghost-free chapter of my life. It wasn't until I started to think about moving on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> on that disturbing and creepy... On that disturbing and creepy things started to happen. I embarked on a post-divorce trip to Paris to find myself, and I ended up finding Fabien, or so he called himself. <laughs> but it was a Eduardo <laughs> in a mustache. And I want to know. How, like, we'll get to it. I, can, I can't remember. If she knows. I was like, did she know? Because his ghost dick felt the same. <laughs> like, I don't understand. 
Man, 20, well, I think 2020 quarantines like really <laughs> cracked a lot of people's psyches. Like, Maybe. <laughs> I was walking down the banks of the River Sin, chasing the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, cowing under my umbrella as raindrops poured off it, and then it struck me, glistening in a puddle, the reflection of a Frenchman. I tilted my umbrella back, but nobody was around. I looked back towards the puddle. The man was clear as the ocean. A holiday romance with a Parisian ghost was surely too good to be true. He later revealed himself as Eduardo. It was a honey trap all along. I couldn't believe I'd been catfished by a ghost. She says Eduardo has become jealous as she now only wants to date men who still have a pulse. She added, I cautiously started to go on dates with living humans. I returned home from a date with a bunch of flowers, and Eduardo thought it would be amusing to pull the heads off all the roses and scatter the petals on my bed. He's even learnt to play careless whisper on the saxophone. <laughs> I mean, at least I think it's him. The sound echoes in the distance sometimes when I'm ta- when I'm taking a bath in candlelight. He's getting- so he has a ghost saxophone he carries around with him. <laughs> <laughs> you'd think he'd is it like having all the time in the world as a ghost. Yeah. You'd know more than just careless whisper. Like <laughs> that's all he needs. <laughs> <laughs> no, he needs to learn the fucking. I still believe from the Lost Boys. He just needs to learn. Yeah. The, he needs to learn the solo. He's getting mm-hmm. really jealous of the fact that I want to date modern man. He knows I no longer find his uniform attractive, so he's going to sh- extreme lengths to pull me in. He's even given himself a modern makeover and presented himself as a Ken doll. So dickless. Like that doesn't seem appealing. <laughs> I thought I was going crazy when the image of him with cropped blonde hair and a pink suit appeared. I could tell it was him, though, as his gaunt, harrowed eyes looked into mine, and slowly he merged back into a rugged Victorian soldier. A medium told me Eduardo would always be with me, and that's a thought that I can't come to terms with. If he could just do that at will, how do you know that he's actually a Victorian soldier? Yeah, maybe he's been lying the whole time. Maybe he's actually that... Yeah. Pink suited Kindle man. Yeah, maybe he's been that the whole time, and he's just trying to reveal his true self. Because he loves you, and you. She blew it. Yeah. <laughs> I feel now, I'm not consenting to Eduardo's of Eduardo's presence, and I'm having trouble getting him to disconnect from me. Moving forward, I feel like I need a bit of flesh on my bones. <laughs> Skeletons and dead men may seem hot, but in reality, they are stone cold, unpredictable, and scary. And the article abruptly ends. As, as they do. But there you go. <laughs> nice. That one was very entertaining. I don't know. Which one did you prefer? Ghost sex or ghost divorce? I don't know. They're both good, man. I will say, man, like the... Uh, I want to see like video video uh, interviews with these ladies. I want to see her... T- like, dude, she actually was pretty good looking. <laughs> I just want to see them talking about it. Like, I want to see yeah. how bad or good actors they are you know what i mean like i I want to hear them describe the sex yeah that too do they leave like a residue oh you slimed me (laughs) look at all this ectoplasm (laughs) like is this and like it is ejaculate from a ghost do they even yeah do they even do they leave a slime trail is it dead sperm like uh, i want to know what it is like, is it the shit from Ghostbusters? Is it just, like, ooze? <laughs> that stuff was really gross. I just want to hear... I want to hear an interview with her. <laughs> I want more details. I want an interview with her, and then I just want somebody to put the bill... He slimed me. <laughs> over it. <laughs> yeah. That's the... Yeah, the headline. <laughs> he slimed me. I have one from uh, AP again. I don't know if some people have probably heard about this. I don't think we covered it on here. But the judge, the Oklahoma judge, who was like sitting in during trials, texting, like murder trials and stuff. <laughs> on phone. Well, it says an Oklahoma judge who sent more than 500 texts during murder trial man or resigns. Woman. Man or woman? Woman. Okay, just wondering. But um, I'm hurting. <laughs> she's on a security camera. The picture right here yeah. shows a security camera above her head. She's 500 on. texts during this one trial. <laughs> It's, it's, it's really sad, dude. She's on a dating app right now. It's like, ugh, I'm hearing testimony texting. about these stabbings. I think she and all I'm trying to do is get stabbed, I if think you know she what I mean. Te- <laughs> I think she was texting someone else in the courtroom. Oh, 
Oh, fuck. That's really fucked up, then. It says, uh, an Oklahoma judge agreed to step down Friday after she was caught sending hundreds of texts from the bench while overseeing a murder trial and the killing of a two-year-old boy, including messages that mocked prosecutors and were sprinkled <laughs> with emojis. <laughs> mocked prosecutors? And as you can see, this two-year-old boy was stabbed. <laughs> She's like, fucking idiots. Look yeah. at his stupid suit. Look at his fucking glasses, yeah. nerd. <laughs> yeah, look at that dumb, dead two-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, like, what the fuck? What the shit, man? District Judge Tracy Soderstrom also agreed to not seek judicial office again in Oklahoma under a proposed settlement agreement. Why would she even get a settlement? Filed with the Oklahoma court and the judiciary. She had faced removal from the bench over accusations that included gross neglect, neglect of duty, oppression in office, lack of proper temperament, and failure, <laughs> and failure to supervise her office. Soderstrom had been scheduled to go on trial in a special court starting Monday. I promised to uphold the Constitution in a fair, even-handed, and efficient manner, Soderstrom said in a resignation letter given to local media. I believe that I have done so. However, being human, I have also faltered (laughs) by (laughs) texting 500 (laughs) texts. Yeah, by saying I'd stab that two-year-old in this stupid face. Yeah, like what the? Uh, this is just crazy. Oklahoma Supreme Court Chief Justice John Kane the Fourth recommended Soderstrom be removed following an investigation that found she mocked prosecutors, laughed at the bailiff's comment about a prosecutor's genitals, <laughs> praised the defense attorney. Ooh, hold on, hold on. The bailiff isn't gonna get any shit either. Like, what's he doing talking about like somebody's like <laughs> talking about somebody's? Like, I don't know, dude. The cop it's, it's, that's it's, supposed it's, to like keep you in order. It's like, ridiculous. Oh, like, fuck! I bet you got a little dick, bro. <laughs> like, what the? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Praised the defense attorney and called the prosecutor's key witness a liar during the murder trial <laughs> of Christian f- Tyler Martzell. Security video published by the Oklahoman showed Soderstrom texting or messaging for minutes at a time during jury selection, opening statements, and testimony during the trial in Chandler, about 45 miles outside of Oklahoma City. She took office last year, voluntarily suspended herself in October. Uh, the judge's texts during the Mar- during Marshall's trial on, on a charge of killing his girlfriend's two-year-old son included saying the prosecutor was, quote, sweating through his coat, according to Kane's petition. The text described the defense attorney as awesome and asked, can I clap for her during the defense's, defense attorney's <laughs> opening arguments. In all, Soderstrom sent more than 500 texts to her bailiff. What? <laughs> also texted a laughing emoji icon to the bailiff who had made a crass and demeaning reference to the prosecuting attorney's genitals. <laughs> oh my god, bailiff, can you believe how how awesome, what a girl boss this de- this defense attorney is? Let's invite her into our thruple. <laughs> Marshall was eventually convicted of second-degree manslaughter and sentenced to time served. So, the guy got off, too, pretty much. What the fuck? So, oh, yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be a mistrial, should it? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Well, the, the thing that like blew my mind, too, was the talking about the, uh... What was it? The, uh... Oh, where was it here? A settlement. Like, so they probably, like... Gave some kind of like payment, you know what I mean? Like of yeah. whatever, leaving the job, but still got some kind of like settlement out of it. Like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, you that's should just thing. be canned, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, sorry, the fact that she's not facing criminal charges is ridiculous because, like, that's criminally negligent. You know what I mean? It's like you can still, oh, you just lost your job and probably got at least half the money you were going to get serving your fucking term. Yeah, at least, if not more. Like that's uh, like that's the sort of shit that kills me, man. That's why nobody respects the law because it's two fucking sets of rules. What you got next? I got another one from the mirror. <laughs> Exclusive: Woman's horror as wildlife cam catches naked witches hosting carcass eating <laughs> ritual. What the fuck is this? Is this- <laughs> yeah, dude. I, is I, the mirror like Weekly World News? Nah. <laughs> Not exactly. 
<laughs> but it's got a bunch of just weird shit. <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I wanted to come out strong this week. Like, I got some. The rest of these aren't going to be nearly as good, but the 36-year-old from Powell River, Canada, found a dead deer at the bottom of her garden. When she and her granddad went to check the trail cam, they were horrified to see two half-naked women appearing to dine on the corpse. I hear like, There's a little picture, dude. Right there. See, there's one of them. Like, you can see the deer shit, and you can... You know, she's in her panties or Where's whatever. the other woman? I don't know. That's the only picture I've got at the moment. See, she set it up. It's like those people I, who do those fake a, trail cam pics. I think it's a prank because we'll get into it. But because uh, also, you know, like witches don't really do that. Witches are more, you know, earthy. and Why the, What's the point of eating a rotten carcass? Pretty much. But anyway, a nature, a nature lover was left horrified when she claims her wildlife camera captured two witches holding a carcass-eating ritual in the dead of night just yards from her house. Karina Stanhope found a dead deer at the bottom of her garden while riding one of her horses and decided to set up a trail camera to see if it would attract any animals at nighttime. But the 36-year-old claims she couldn't believe her eyes when her and her granddad, Bob, 76, checked the, <laughs> checked the footage the next day and saw two half-naked women appearing to dine on the corpse. Images show what appear to be two figures with long, matted black hair, wearing just a piece of cloth cl- cloth covering their buttocks, standing over the dead deer. I was about to say, if that woman, she was wearing panties, I was wondering if she was actually wearing a shirt. Because she was wearing a shirt, she's not half yeah. naked. That's not half naked. Yeah. True. If you had a shirt on, you had to be bottomless. True. <laughs> I'd feel like having your snatch out would be a little more witchy. Yeah. But with their hair covering their faces, the figures appear to squat down and reach over over to the carcass with long fingers before picking up a hoof and taking a bite. How do you bite a hoof? <laughs> you're going to break your nah, teeth. You're going to have fucking some strong jaws, dude. And this is all set up. I think this woman that reported it set it up. Probably. Karina says she was left terrified as her house is just two, a two-minute walk from where the figures were lurking. And she keeps her three horses on the same land. Well, fuck, man, if they're hoof biters, sure. I'd be scared, too. <laughs> After sharing the haunting images online last week, the wildlife enthusiast was inundated with comments from petrified social media users who urged her to call the cops <laughs> and suggested they were witches, walking demons, or even Wendigos. <laughs> Karina from Pal Canada said, There was a dead deer. <laughs> there was a dead deer, so me... So me and my grandpa put up a trail camera to see if we could see animals and got a bobcat on camera, which was pretty cool. It was pretty cool, eh? <laughs> I came the next day and grandpa said he got naked people on the camera and said, no, you did And I said, no, you didn't. Bullshit. Grab some brewskis. We'll sit down and watch <laughs> so it. he told me. <laughs> yeah, grandpa Bob hadn't had a heart on in 20 years, but <laughs> this sure shit got him randy. I don't know what the heck was up with that. It really freaked us out. It's not something you see every day. <laughs> they came ten minutes after sunset. They look disheveled. It looks like they have wigs on. One looks like she has blonde hair underneath. I didn't buy the wigs at all. <laughs> you can't really tell from the photos, but the hoof was brought right up to her mouth. I don't know if she was kissing it, smelling, or eating it. B- bitch, you could have walked up and seen if it had a bite in it. <laughs> it was like, but to touch a decaying carcass like that makes me feel sick. The amount of bacteria that must have been on there. That's how you catch hoof and mouth disease. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they were paying their respects, but they were naked. It really creeped me out because it's only a two minute walk from our house. Because our hoose. Because naked it's wrong to be naked. <laughs> you should be clothed at all times, even in the shower. I was concerned about them messing with my horses at night. The mum of three shared the images on social media, and people from the area were convinced that she'd caught witches, evil spirits, demons, or a local cult performing a ritual on camera. Nurse Karina said, A lot of people mention skinwalkers and wendigos. There's rumors around town about a cult that collects animal bones. I don't know if it's real or not. Some people have mentioned it since I posted the photos. A friend said they came across two people in the woods carrying some dead squirrels. Yeah, hunters. (laughs) 
The horses always get really spooked and unnerved around that area. I thought they imagined stuff at first, so I didn't think anything of it. Oh, she's, she's creating lore. <laughs> Maybe I believe them now. <laughs> yeah, I believe the horses that I talk to, like Mr. Ed. The fuck? <laughs> Karina says she was tempted to contact the police, but Bob, Bob pointed out that they weren't doing anything illegal, and she hopes that some passerby spotted the camera and decided to play a prank. Karina said, I'm hoping they were, when they went for a walk in the day, saw the trail cam that was set up, and wanted to have a bit of fun with us, or they're on some good drugs. Maybe both. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to go to the police, but Grandpa said, no, they weren't, no, they weren't doing anything illegal, technically. He was, he was pretty mortified. Despite Karina attempting to explain the freaky images as possibly a prank, social media users were less convinced and warned her to be careful. One wrote, this is actually terrifying. Another said, that's a skinwalker. They look human. So you come up to them, and once you do, you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's another, an expert on skinwalkers. Yeah, another one. No one, no one would just randomly eat a dead thing unless it was a wild animal. Well, I mean, it was a dead wild animal, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically a walking demon from hell. If you hear screaming, stay inside and get a gun. You leave it alone. A third added, I'd say when to go. Stay safe, please, and don't go out alone. <laughs> I, just, like, just like every day, I, I say when to go. <laughs> Hold on, let's see. Commenters urged them to contact the police, while others tried to reassure them that it was probably just a prank. One commenter said, Yeah, I think it was a prank. In the last picture, it looks like you can see blonde curly hair under a long black wig. The figure closest to the camera. A second wrote, Okay, so I hate to be that person, but have you called the cops? <laughs> the article abruptly ends. It always, he's always in with like people's like comments. I have one from the mirror. Oh, nice. Yeah, her mirror. But it's nothing It's nothing on the level of the ones you had. This is just grim ocean monster washes up on beach. Turns out to be real life mummified dolphin. So I've got mummies all over mine today. <laughs> yeah, damn. Terrifying dolphin carcass washed up on a beach last month and was later dubbed an ocean monster. Experts think it was mummified by de by drying out its own skin. All right. A mummified dolphin that washed up on South Carolina beach, on a South Carolina beach, has been dubbed an ocean monster by terrified members of the public. Marine experts were called out to reports of a stranded dolphin on Hilton Head Island last month. When they arrived, they were greeted by the horrific sight of a seriously decomposed mammal. What is going on? Okay. Its characteristic gray color had almost entirely been replaced by a white film, and you could even make out the bones on the carcass. The Low Country Marine Mammal Network said the dolphin had likely spent too much time in the sun and was eventually washed up washed up to sea. No. That's the <laughs> typos and shit. Typos, man. yeah. It was actually the second time it was called out. They were called out in one weekend. After a decomposed dolphin appeared 18 miles away. This weekend, our team responded to two dolphin strandings. The first was reported the evening of Thursday, uh, January 11th on Botany Bay. And due to storms and location challenges, we were not able to respond until that Saturday, uh, January 13th. So, more so than... Worrying about them being monsters. Maybe you should worry. We should be worrying about why are they beaching why themselves? Why are we getting all these uh, dolphins washing up dead on the shores? Yeah, is there of South Carolina? Are they depressed? Um, it says although both animals did not provide many samples, we still collect location, species, gender, age, size, and skin, which contributes to our baseline data. One confused Facebook user responded asking how a dolphin could possibly end up mummified. Our guess is it was sitting in the sun somewhere remote, dried the skin, and then the animal got washed out and moved to the location where it was found. I mean, that's... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, it was not an ocean monster. Just like the Montauk monster. Remember that shit from years ago? Oh, I don't think they, they ever actually figured out what that thing was. Oh, yeah. But that would, 
a lot of people thought that was like some kind of experiment because it's across from that. Oh, oh that weird lab and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that's all I have for articles. I do. Have, I, mean, I have some other stuff to cover, but like article wise, I'm that's I'm spent, bro. So what do you got? I I got a few. I guess. Uh, give me a sec. You want? I've got a few. So how many more do you want to do? Oh, you my. You can give me. You can do whatever you want, baby. Yeah, cause here I you so, cause we can save some of these. I've either got mutant wolves. Do the just yeah. Just mess, go with that. Hold, hold on. I uh, meth. I, I'll. I mean, you I'll said re- mutant wolves. I'll, I want to hear that. I'll read you my the three best shit about mutant wolves: meth, Dairy Queen, or snoring neighbor stabbed. Nah, um, mutant wolves. All right. Give me a mutant wolves, and we'll go on to what I got. Give me there, mutant wolves, baby. I want to hear all From about. From the New York Post. Mutant wolves roaming Chernobyl exclusion zone have oh. developed cancer resilient abilities. Whoa, that's cool. How, literally, this is how they open the article. How, how about that? How about that? (laughs) Mutant wolves that roam the human-free Chernobyl exclusion zone have developed cancer-resilient genomes that could be key to helping humans fight the deadly disease, according to a study. Oh, so, looks like they're going to try to reverse engineer this shit. That's how you get fucking werewolves, bro. Cool. Science werewolves. Sign me up. The wild animals have managed to adapt and survive the high levels of radiation that have plagued the area after a nuclear reactor at the Chernobyl power plant exploded in 1986, becoming the world's worst nuclear accident. Humans abandoned the area after the explosion, or after the explosion leaked cancer causing radiation into the environment, and a 1,000 square mile zone was roped off to prevent further human exposure. But, the nearly 38 years since the nuclear disaster, wildlife has reclaimed the area, including packs of wolves that seem to be unaffected by the chronic exposure to the radiation. Here, look, they're tagging one of the wolves. I mean, it kind of looks like a regular wolf to me, but apparently they've mutated. They're mutated. <laughs> Kara Love, an evolutionary biologist and... I was ag- hoping they would have, like, really, like... Oh, we might see some. Weird-looking fun- features. We may eventually see some, but yeah. Carol Love, an evolutionary biologist and ectotoxologist in Shane Campbell Station's lab at Princeton University, has been studying how the mutant wolves have evolved to survive their radioactive environment and presented her findings at the annual meeting of the Society of Interrogative, Interrogative and Comparative Biology in Seattle, Washington last month. In 2014, Love and her colleagues went inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone and put GPS collars equipped with radiation dosimeters on the wild wolves. They also took blood from the animals to understand their responses to the cancer-causing radiation. According to a release published by the Society of Interrogative, Interrogative and Comparative Biology, with the specialized collars, the researchers can get real-time measurements of where the wolves are and how much radiation they are exposed to, Love said. They learned that the wolves are exposed to 11.28 milrim of radiation daily for their lifespans, more than six times the legal safety limit for humans. The Chernobyl wolves' immune systems appear different than normal wolves, similar to those of cancer patients going through through radiation treatment, the researchers found. Love pinpointed specific regions of the wolves' genome that seem to be resilient to increased cancer risk and the release states. Or, hold on. Cancer, the release states, my bad. The research could be key to examining how gene mutations in humans could increase the odds of surviving cancer, flipping the script on many known gene mutations like BRCA that cause cancer. Chernobyl dogs, the descendants of former residents' pets, may also possess similar cancer resilience, though they haven't been studied the same way as their wild cousins. Dogs were immediately in the area after the disaster and have adapted better than other species like birds, which experienced extreme genetic defects as a result of the toxic radiation. The findings are especially valuable as scientists have learned that canines fight off cancer more similarly to the way humans do than lab rats. Unfortunately, Love's work has stalled somewhat as she and her colleagues have been unable to return to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, first due to the COVID-19 pandemic and now due to the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. So, interesting, but, you know, we're not going to get anything, uh, we're uh, not going to get anything more on that until, you know, 
that war is over, I right. assume. Exactly. <laughs> it's interesting, though. Like, it's wild. Like, have you seen the bears? Like the pictures of the bears? Yeah, dude, I've seen stuff? pictures. I've seen pictures of the dogs, and the dogs are exactly what you thought the wolves would have looked like. The wolves look normal. Yeah, the, the bears. Some of the bears are weird looking too. Um, next thing I had was just like some video game news because you know, uh, people who are into it, whatever. I am, so I'm going to talk about it. All right. It's Tekken 8's release, and uh, man, this game is killer dude and it's really what well, the cool thing about it is because it's the first time we've ever everybody in the world has gotten taken at the same time pretty much you know what i mean like it's usually like an arcade release yeah and then they like work out bugs they do this that and like most you know mainly people in japan are getting to play it in the arcades and shit but it's all released at the same time but just like the features like um you know the story mode is awesome then you've got like the arcade quest, you've got all this really cool like practice shit. They got all this, we can do like punishment training. They have this new like replay system, it's pretty badass. Like when you're in well, fights, what's punishment training is that like punishment know, as training? You use ever expand, you ever, can pick, ever larger butt plugs for, I mean, yeah, to stretch your butt. I mean, never mind, but like, <laughs> but like, what you, yeah, you go in, you can like pick a character you fight against, you want to learn against, and you can yeah. learn all your punishes. Gives you, like, some training on, which, I mean, if you want extensive training, you're still going to have to go and practice. But it's got all this recording stuff you can do where you can have a tr- character you have trouble with. Go in yeah. and do the moves that you've been having trouble with and learn ways around it. But the punishment training gives you a general setup, setup from every character to learn what your moves of your character will punish what certain things they're doing. And, like, then you can... It, has the replay. The replay shit is the coolest, man. Like, it's got the re, uh, replay tips... Which seven had replays, and you could go in and it would give you tips. But in this one, you can go back to your replay. Mm. You can take control of yourself in the replay. Okay. And do something different, like wherever you messed up. You can also take control of your opponent in the replay. Huh. And, like, work on... I mean, they've given all these new options of, like, learning the game. And, like, it's just pretty badass because I was reading here, like, Tekken 7, which was a successful game. Well, at the time, I think it was the most successful, besides maybe three. Mm-hmm. It In its almost its entire span, it sold around 10 million copies. Tekken 8 has sold, since January 25th, 2 million copies. It's out, I think it outsold, from what I'm hearing, it even outsold Street Fighter VI's first two weeks. Oh, wow. Like, which is crazy, because I didn't think it would... You know, Street Fighter has always been the top of the heap just in popularity because it's Street Fighter. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but, but like, it's also been steadily going downhill for, six is, for a long time. Six is pretty good. Like, but they've... They've kind of, like, slacked off. Like, um, a lot of people are kind of disappointed in the way they're doing, like, release of information and updates on things. And, like, they're kind of, like... I don't know. All that's a different story. But, like, Tekken 8 is, like, it's been, like, and people are finding, like, small things, like, little bugs and stuff like that, and, like, certain things in combos that, you know, shouldn't be working the way they are. And, I mean, Namco's on top of it. Like, they're communicating with everybody. It's, like, the complete opposite of MK1. I don't know if you've heard about MK1. I didn't really get into MK1, dude. I, like, I, I love fighting. People are so it. pissed about that game. Like, <clears throat> oh, like... No, no, oh yeah, Tekken 8, Tekken and Street Fighter 6 both have crossplay. Yeah. No crossplay when MK1 came out. Like, the net code sucks balls. <laughs> like, there's all these bugs, all this shit, like, um, all these microtransactions, having people pay like $10 for a fatality. Yeah, see, this is part, of the, like, re- this is part of the reason I haven't Warner gotten Brothers, any- bro. This is part of the reason I haven't been into a lot of fighting games recently because a lot of them are moving towards shit like that. And I, it's been, I love fighting games, but I, I can't remember the last one I got heavy into. And the sad thing is, I know offhand the one I can remember, and I'm sure I've played more since this, but I played in Inju- the fuck out of Injustice Two for a long time. Yeah, and I didn't, even, the, I didn't enjoy Injustice too much. Yeah, I know. I liked Injustice, but it was good. Yeah, it was good, but I loved Injustice Two. Mostly because, like, the thing we were complaining about with the armor 
in ranked matches, it was it was exactly what I wanted it to be. It was aesthetic. It had no bearing on yeah. making I was just the, There was a way you could play. You could play things that weren't ranked where you could have the extra stats, which that's all right as long as it's not ranked. But I, I like the idea of, you know, kind of like Tekken does where you can customize your character. But yeah. It's just aesthetic. Well, it's a thing about that wasn't even like the biggest problem for me with Injustice 2 was the armor stuff wasn't. It was like the way it played. There was something about it I just did not like the way it played. It was a far more defensive game than the first one was, for one thing. But I that know. wasn't even a problem because I don't mind defensive. Really, you know, I felt like I felt like, like the first one was more defensive. But like, because any time any people I played more regularly with Injustice seemed to be more defensive minded, where a lot of people attacked a lot more. It seemed like, but I did like um, uh, Black Manta. I liked him a lot. Yeah, game and Gorilla Grodd. Which it was like it was like bittersweet for me because like everybody that I wanted to be like added in the first game, almost everybody I wanted to be added in the first game ended up being in Injustice Two. Yeah. But then I didn't enjoy the game as much. I was annoyed. I think I've told you before because like I didn't, I wasn't able to have like a copy of Injustice. Like I just played it at people's houses and yeah. I, I got pretty good. I was competitive, but uh, I actually had a copy of Injustice Two. And then, and I got, and I was better at it than even in Justice One. But then nobody in my fucking friend group wanted to goddamn play it. <laughs> I might go back and still play it. And I was, I'd go back and play fucking Injustice. Fucking as well. mad. I'd go back and play that every once in a while. Like, like. And my my main character in the first one was Joker. Yeah, it was also Joker in the second one. Uh, originally, because I didn't, I didn't want to get good with Batman in the first one because it just because I love Batman and it felt too obvious. But, uh, dude, I tell you what, I liked Batman in the second one better than I did the first one, and I got pretty good with him. I got good with Joker, Batman, Joker, Batman, and I was really good with Green Arrow, too. Oh, I loved Green Arrow in the first one. He was good in the first one, but I, I thought they improved him in the other one, especially, like, uh, I don't know, man. It felt like his gadgets were a little bit better, and, like, the, con- I don't know, it, it was really, he was fun. Yeah, but, like, this whole MK1 thing is, like... It's just like a clusterfuck. Like then they have not been like communicating, and this is the weirdest thing. When you know you know things are going bad for like almost a month now, I think Ed Boone has been like radio silent. Oh yeah, he's always communicating with people, always making like posts on like Twitter and crap like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. nothing, and like he's probably fucking embarrassed because it's not just his baby. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's been since the beginning and it's like i know a lot of it's probably forced yeah warner brothers because they own nether realm and like it's like you got to do it this way you got to make us money this is our money maker but the game I, I feel like it was rushed and like the story was pretty fun i played the story mode in it yeah but i never even made it to playing online like i was like i, I just couldn't get into it enough and then like um Maybe he's just radio silent because he's working on Injustice 3. <laughs> well, let's hope if they're making an Injustice 3, it's better than MK1. Have you heard? Because MK1 is... There's been rumors floating around, and I don't know if it's just wishful thinking because everybody's wanted it forever, but there's been rumors floating around for probably about a year that there's going to be a, a Marvel versus DC game in the style of Injustice. That would be sweet. That would be fucking awesome. Because I've always thought it was like I don't get me wrong I like Marvel versus Capcom except for like that last couple weren't that great, uh, but well not three was decent. Four, yeah, three so. was pretty three, good. Three like, was three's good. pretty popular. Infin- uh it was, what's it called? In, it was uh, the one with Ultron Infinite. that sucked. Infinite. But like uh, the gameplay is cool. It's like that's what I kind of agree. Like oh yeah, the roster, and then they took it down to only two, two characters. Or whatever, instead of three on the yeah. team. But, like, I agreed, like, when I watched videos of the Maximilian dude who's big on YouTube with fighting games and stuff, especially Capcom games, he had all these hangups, of course. He, he doesn't cut him any slack. He's like a Capcom, big Capcom fan. Yeah. But when they deserve it, I mean, he, he you know what I mean? He, yeah. He says it how it is. And, like, that's what he was talking about. The, the, the base, like, system, fighting system of uh, Marvel... Versus Capcom Infinite was cool, mm. but everything else was just like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, 
the character selection, selection, the art style, like I don't know, the whole it was just like, but the, the yeah, I play it and I'm I'm downloaded it later. I think it was free. It was either like free or like it's one of the monthly games or something yeah. on PlayStation or. It was on sale for like super sale, so I bought it. And like a lot of the like costumes and like a few of the characters, I think, were like free at that point, where you could just download them. Yeah. And uh, I actually had some fun. I played some of the story, and I thought it was like hilarious because like Arthur from fucking Ghosts yeah, and Goblins yeah. was part of the story, the main story and shit. And I like, remember playing through <laughs> a little bit of the story. I don't know if I finished it. It was like Captain America just looked so. Uh, just the art style was just like yeah, crap, dude. I don't know if they rushed. I mean, you remember the whole? I, mean, you, I still remember like when they first released pictures and like the Chun Li stuff, and people like just fucking cracking on and making fun of the Chun Li design, dude. Like how terrible she looked. Of course, they redid her yeah. face and everything, but like she still. It, I mean, yeah, it was pretty bad. Mega Man looked goofy. Like I don't know, there's just something about that. I don't know who did that, but like it was, it was bad. Like whatever team they had working on the the art style was I, like. I just hope it's which true. I've never been in a real good agreement. Sorry to interrupt, but in agreement with some of the art decisions Capcom's done with their fighting games over the past what twenty years now or more. Like since Third Strike, since after Third Strike, I've yeah, okay. not agreed with their art direction. Yeah, I'm kind. I'm with you. No, because. And, well, that's kind of where I fall again. Not counting like, uh, not counting like Marvel versus Capcom three and some stuff like that. But yeah, they're yeah Marvel versus line- Capcom MVC three looked yeah. pretty good. Oh yeah, and, and the skins were kind of had that sh- cell shading kind of look to them. Yeah, and the skins were fun for some char- and characters that hadn't been in it like Thor. Well, that was pretty cool. Taskmaster, oh man, I fucking love Taskmaster. Yeah, he was in cool that in that game and. Um, like Zero. Chris Redfield, Chris Redfield was cool. He was so. good. Zero being in it, yeah, that was neat. But yeah, I liked a lot of that stuff. But yeah, man, I, I just really haven't been a huge fan of the Street Fighter series then, since like Third Strike. To be honest with well, you, Six is fun, and it looks good. It looks I, pretty I've good. I've got to start. I've got to give that more of a chance. But I absolutely hate Four and Five. Yeah, I, mean, I think Four and Five are fucking dog shit. Yeah, I, just, I didn't really enjoy 4 much. A lot of people love 4, it, and I give it its credit where it's due. It did save the it did save the franchise. It was on a downslope, yeah. and it did, its sales and like popularity did save the franchise quite a bit. 5, obviously, was crap. Like, the la- the final product of 5 is a total diff- different game than when it released, yeah. but it's still... Man, I um, I do hope though. Like I said, I, I really hoping that they're that it's serious because I would love to see a Marvel versus DC game because I want to see Marvel. I want to I want a more serious style for the for the fighting because the the only time I could the last time I remember them actually kind of having a serious style was like that Marvel Rise of the Imperfects game. Remember that we used to play occasionally with like it had Spider Man, the Human Torch. That was more like a. Wasn't it more like an arena arena battle game? I mean, it, you only could have one v ones like when when you actually fought each other. But it was like a yeah, it was a bigger normal arena. fighting game, or was it an arena fighter? It was an arena. You could run around, throw yeah. shit at each other. The only pro- like the that was pretty remember. cool. But the thing about it, you know, it had like Daredevil, Venom, Spider Man, yeah, and then those weird and perfect characters that no one cared about. But the pro- the problem with that game is it was not balanced. At all. No. Like, I mean, if you got really... We had some fun with that game. Oh, yeah. And if you got really good, because, like, Wolverine was on the lower end of being able to, of being able to like, throw down. Like, Spider-Man and Venom could pretty much hang with anybody. Iron Man was ridiculous. And what if, if I remember correctly, like, the imperfect characters were the ones that were overpowered. Oh, they? yeah, yeah. But they, were, they had, like, equivalents on the, Marvel, or on the Marvel side. But that was the thing, is, like, you could get really... You could get good enough to where you could take out some, like, ridiculous character like i remember being wolverine and taking on some people i should not have been able to beat and i remember being being venom being able but again venom could hang with like anybody yeah i mean at marvel versus dc in the injustice style that would be awesome dude like two you know a one-on-one just straight up fighting game i feel like like 
I just wonder what what roster you would end up getting because it would have to be huge. And I think that's what one of the things this is cool with is like. And I'm not so. (coughs) I hear that they're going to be putting in some things, which I got to give Harada props in Tekken World because he has kept most like he's kept my like just straight up ridiculous microtransactions out of Tekken yeah. for years. Like he was like he completely kept it out of they were gonna charge for Boskanovich and um Slim Bob and like a few of the extra characters, but he was like, no, 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 no. And they finally had him just in an update and they came out in the game later. It's just a free update. And then Tekken Seven, they had DLC characters, mm. but it was stuff they started adding after the game was selling so good, Wh- and which, they were like, "Oh, we can add." So, you know what I mean? Like that, dude. That's the way I think that fight. I've said this for a while. I think that's the way fighting games need to be done. It's like, especially if you're gonna have like a thing where it's two franchises, come up with the roster you're gonna come up with. You know, like if you're gonna have forty characters, you have forty characters. If you want to have some secret characters, they need to be unlocked in game by doing like crazy shit like you beat the story mode with everyone or you yeah. did this and have a couple of unlocks which Tekken 8 has has unlocks for like costumes and stuff like that for doing certain things in arcade quest and yeah. that's great i love i love in game unlock unlocks because it makes you want to play the game more and get better yeah it's it incentivizes you to do that and then uh the when it comes to dlc characters like, let's say they did do a Marvel versus DC game. Okay, then we're going to add four characters. Either do a thing where you have a poll, like four characters, two characters from Marvel, two characters from DC that aren't in the game. Either fucking release a poll w- for Marvel with so many characters, top two win. Same with DC, top two win. Those are your four D- DLC characters. Yeah, like do like do like a poll of like 10 DC characters, then 10 Marvel characters, yeah. top two. But yeah, like, and that's, yeah, and you saw that with Tekken 7, you could tell clearly one of the most obvious was, I think, was Gigas and Marduk, and then where they didn't realize, you know, and they ended up adding characters later because of, you know, popularity, and King and Armor King, because King had some of Armor King's moves. Mm. Armor King obviously was not originally planned to be in Tekken 7. Yeah. Because... He's dead. King, well, no, because King had. There's a new Armor King. There's a different guy who took oh. up the mantle. But like, but Armor, but King had some of Armor King's moves. Yeah. So obviously they probably originally had not planned to put Armor King in there. Yeah. So they go, okay, we'll we'll give him a couple of Armor King's moves to soften the blow yeah. to Armor King fans. You know what I mean? But like, they ended up putting Armor King in, and he was one of the most most popular DLC and popular characters in Tekken Seven after that. But like, um, Marduk. Gigas had some Marduk moves. They ended up adding Marduk later because, yeah, such great sales. And then like, Gigas was kind of rendered. He was unpopular anyway, even though I was he was my main. But yeah. like, he was unpopular anyway. But he had Marduk moves. Obviously, they were probably not planning to put Marduk in the game. Ended up putting him in. So it's like I I don't mind that kind of stuff. Yeah. Tekken Eight is already chock full of op features, S- releases with thirty released with thirty two characters. Nice, like, arc you know arcade quest story mode individual character uh, storyline. So they play like they have the ad, they so they all this stuff. So they, if they bring, end up putting some stuff that you got to pay if you want to buy. If they put some costume stuff in there, optional. That's yeah. just costume stuff that some motherfucker wants to go, oh, okay, I'll pay a dollar or two for that because I want that. That's fine yeah. because they've already put so much in the game. Yeah. It's a complete game. It's not like Street Fighter V wasn't released. It's like I can get behind that. But like when you got this stuff where you're with like Mortal Kombat 1 where it's like you got to buy these combat coins for a fatality or yeah. – And the, the – you know, like the um, – what do they call it? The – Brutalities. The thing on the side, the little quest thing is just like the crypt. Oh yeah. All this stuff, the, that kind of shit is like all this pain, buying coins, buying combat coins, buying combat coins. See, I don't mind when they have. I don't mind the crypt when it's you can just earn all the coins in game. 
You yeah. know what I mean? Like, that's fine. If you want an alternate fatality or these skins or that. But if it's like, no, buy this premium. You might have been up to be able to do that, but I think maybe it was like, it takes forever. Yeah, because th- that was some shit that was wrong with Injustice 2 with, like, the costume stuff. Is like, oh, you need X amount of gold coins. And and it takes you, like, 5,000 hours of play. Yeah. Which I can't, you know. But, uh, like, so with 8, they brought back the individual story, like, ladders, where you get a fucking end. Well, what is cool, you'll like this, is because they did this, and I was hoping they would use her, because when Tekken 8 was coming out, mm. when they were releasing the trailers, I don't know if you watched them, because I posted them on that Facebook page. I did watch page, a few, yeah. How they have the pride announcer woman. Yeah, okay. Well, um, for the tournament part of the story, and for the individual people's stories that you do, you do a little... You do several fights. It's not like a. It's not quite like arcade mode was in older Tekken games or Street yeah. Fighter and stuff like that. You didn't fight like ten matches. Yeah. You don't fight like ten matches. You fight like a handful of matches. But like she does the announcement. Yeah. And stuff. And she in the story mode, she's doing the announcement for the Iron Fist tournament that Kazuya has started up again. Okay. And like, um, but yeah, like each person has like a story, and they're like the classic style, like goofy shit. Some of them like. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Oh, and they've went over. You love this, dude. They have went headlong into. You noticed. You known that the stories for like martial law and Paul for years have been like goofy as hell. It's like yeah. they they're some kind of scheme to win the tournament money, and then they end up losing it or they don't ever get it. And Paul and Marshall's always ended up like completely broke. And like Except now for- he's like he starts the fight and he literally starts it and does his little. Getting ready, like doing this Bruce Lee thing, and then he's like, "I hate rich people." And like he's, they <laughs> went headlong into him, like being like <laughs> this, this, like <laughs> it's funny as hell, dude. But like um, they've done great with all that. But like the Jack story, like I went through with Jack, Jack Eights, like they have their individual little things. Like if they won the tournament, yeah, non-canon. Oh, this character won the King of Iron Fist. Because the story is, is Kazuya is like wanting to bring chaos to everything. And like, he brings back the Iron Fist tournament and pretty much different people from different countries um, enter. It's kind of like the Dragon Ball Super thing where their country loses. He's, he pretty much is like, I guess, going to destroy them or whatever. Yeah. The country that wins the tournament. Because he's running G Corp. Yeah. Hihachi's dead. He killed yeah. Hihachi. Whoever, whatever person wins, their country or whatever in government takes control of the Mishima Zahabatsu. They oh, okay. get they get a reward. That's their reward. That's cool. And uh so like in the individual stories, it's kinda like what would happen to these this person. And like Laws was hilarious. I don't want to like ruin anything for people, but I'm going to anyway. Laws is he he wins, and him and Paul Paul is like his. He's like sitting in this chair, all like he's all cool, and he's got the the seventies looking Bruce Lee outfit on with the sunglasses and stuff. And he's like calling Paul his sidekick, and like Paul walks up and he's like he's like, "What do you need, sidekick?" And like Paul's like, "I got the uh, the bill from the UN and the something nations like of all, all of the damages that the the mission was about to have caused." And he looks at it, and it's like all these zeros, and like he's broke again. Like, <laughs> like he's completely, and like, but it's just like those kind of endings, like the the classic silly ass. Yeah, see, that's that's what I'm fine with because I've disliked how that's the one thing I've disliked is I'm fine with having a story mode for all these games, but I like arcade mode where people get an individual ending. Like I, I've always liked that, yeah. and that. That's what I that's what I didn't like about six. Like, because six didn't have that. It was essentially like, what was the thing they introduced in four? Tekken Force. Talking about Tekken Force? Yeah, where you go through, it's like an RPG almost. Like, fight these, fight these. It's almost, yeah, it's weird. And there's one part in the actual story mode they brought back that Tekken Force style. Yeah. Because there's this big battle. Yeah. And that was the part I liked the least, even though it wasn't terrible. It was just, it had that awkward Tekken Force. You're controlling a fighting game character in a fighting game way. But you're in a 3D space fighting multiple enemies. Yeah. And it's just weird. Which I was like, it was it was neat in four. Yeah. And it was neat in five, but they still had their arcade ladders, which I liked. Six, I don't think they yeah, had. Yeah, because it was called Tech and Force mode, right? Yeah. It was like an op separate. That's what I didn't like because I feel if I remember correctly, because I, I played the fuck out of four and five, dude. 
But if I remember correctly, six, the story mode was essentially like a Tekken Force game. Probably. I don't know. And really then I think remember. it I then think I think it went, went through that one. Then I think it went into like some and I could be wrong because I remember messing around with it and I didn't like six was the only one I, I remember in the series that I don't like and didn't fuck with. It's the one I fucked with the least. And but don't get me wrong, I could I could be wrong because maybe I just didn't get far enough and maybe there was more fuck because I was just like, ugh. Didn't it? but that being said, that's the only one I haven't really cared for. Tekken, I, I think of all the fighting game franchises I can think of. And it's not even my favorite. It's really good. It's up there. It's one of my favorites. But it's probably the most consistently good fighting game. Oh, yeah. Like, it, it, it's consistent across, like, games. And I think games. partially is why it, and going back to this, why is because they always released the initial game in arcade. Mm -hmm. And they fine-tuned it over time in the arcade. Yeah. And then re then released, once it was fi pretty fine-tuned, they released the home console versions and like uh, this is the first time they hadn't done that and people are very surprised there a lot of people like you know guys who have been pros and stuff for years they were like worried like hey, this game's gonna be broken you know what i mean like yeah. or release because you know it's just they're just releasing it yeah to everybody at once but it's actually i mean they have found some things but like in the grand scheme of things they done a pretty damn good job. It's pretty well, polished and like. Also, it probably doesn't matter as. <coughs> it probably doesn't matter as much as it did. Like refining it back in the day in arcade makes a lot of sense when you're not going to have updates that can fix your fucking game. Like Tekken well, Four. I mean, Tekken Four. Yeah, wasn't, I mean, but I mean, they even did that with Seven. Yeah, but Tekken Four wasn't going to have that. Yeah. And Tekken Five or Tekken Five wasn't going to have that, and everything back wasn't going to have that. You're. And yeah, they may have re refined seven in the arcades, but now as quickly as you can respond to things, because of you know the nature of consoles and just gaming in general. I mean, think again, Baldur's Gate three. How many times like they're constantly putting out patches if people find shit. There's like, people got pissed because like, oh, I'm one of the shorter characters. I'm a dwarf or I'm a gnome, and I can't like the. Uh, Character I romance can't fucking kiss me. They kiss the fucking air. Or I kiss their waist or some shit within like a month or a few weeks or something. There's a, the there was a fat, there was a fix on shit like that. So yeah. I mean, I mean, it's cool. Larian's doing that. Though. No, I mean, it's awesome that anybody can do and that. That's back to the MK1 thing is like how quickly now, like same way with Bandai and Tekken 8, things people found, things people talk yeah. about. Harada's already on there addressing, telling people, we've heard you talking about this. We're looking into this. We're doing this. And, like, that's the problem. And, and like, all these Mortal Kombat players are jumping ship. Yeah. Like, there, a lot of people are considering this game is about to be dead already. Because there's no communication. Yeah. They're not fixing anything. They delayed, um, they came out and they're delaying, uh, what's his dick that, that John Cena played? Peacemaker. Oh, yeah, Peacemaker. Peacemaker's a guest character. They're delaying him now. Like, all this shit. Like, that, what I don't even get is they're having Homelander and Omni-Man. It's like, wouldn't they... Aren't they going to have pretty much sim, pretty similar play styles? You would think. You would think. Like, Omni-Man's already out, I think. But, like, Homelander's not yet. But, like... I don't know. But anyway, it's just like... It's it's the perfect example right now going on with like Tekken Eight, and you can even lump in Baldur's Gate, Larian, of how to do it and how not to. In real time, we're seeing that with Nether Realm and then and, those and that's two the games. thing you should you should definitely especially you should definitely put out like the game that you think you should definitely put out a game as finished and polished as you think it is. Like I, I understand that almost every game is going to have a couple of glitches. But they should be as minimal as fucking possible, and I do know that it took the development of Baldur's Gate three for like it was in a beta test for like ever, a, yeah, a, yeah, a year or two, and then even then still had some bugs because it was so fucking big. But they responded to it quick. It's not like fucking Bethesda putting out Starfield. I haven't heard. I've heard one. I've only heard one person say anything fucking positive about Starfield. Everybody else I've heard talk about it, and I have no desire to play it. Is that it's buggy. It's big and empty. It's fucking boring. Well, yeah, and it was getting pretty decent reviews when it first came out. It was like kind of mixed. Yeah, but more, a lot of people were giving it some pretty good praise. But then 
like a few months later, when people were finishing it, that's when the negative stuff really started rolling out. Yeah. Because people had had time to go yeah. through the entire story mode and all that kind of shit. I don't know, dude. I don't even want to get into that. I'm real worried for Elder Scrolls. Because <sighs> Bethesda just keeps going downhill. Maybe they'll be forced to like put a little bit of... Todd Howard needs to go. Yeah, that's for sure. I'm worried about... Elder Scrolls only because Bethesda has been like striking out so hard. But yeah, Todd, Todd Howard's in, in there just stroking. Hey, that shit with he, the person standing up and asking at that Q and A. Did you see that shit? Nah, it was maybe. funny because I just talked to our friend Edward before. Oh, you talking? You're talking about talking the about he played. He downloaded it. He was all about it. He's got the. He's got a. Didn't we talk four thousand dollar computer? I feel like we talked about this on one of the earlier episodes. Yeah, man. and he was playing. And he was like, this is terrible. This shit will not run correctly on my system. This is ass. He got a refund. Yeah. Next day or two at this thing, some kind of expo, I don't know where the hell it was. Some guy stood up and asked Todd Howard, he's like, why, you know, what are you going to do about this uh, Starfield running optimally on PCs? Like, you just need a new P, you just need a stronger and better PC. It's like, yeah, there's no way. If he had a $4,000 PC with all the shit he What's had, he it, should, it should have run. Like, what is, did Todd Howard is, he's, his ego has gotten way out of control. Yeah. He just thinks he can say whatever. Dude, he needs to, he needs to go. You're right. Uh, the only thing that gives me hope for the new Elder Scrolls is the fact that it's been in development for so long. If it's been, I don't know. I feel like it's supposed to have been. I thought they've been working on it forever. If they've been working I, I on it... I think they just... When people kept asking and asking and asking in that trailer... Remember that trailer? It just yeah. showed landscape and said Elder Scrolls 6. I think they just threw that together. Uh, if, if that's the case, then yeah, I'd be just as worried. But if they've been working on it that long, I, it's possible. This is the longest amount of time. They said if it's going to come out, it probably won't be out until like 2026. 2000. I thought it was, was going to be two, 2025. Maybe. But like... 2011. I know. Is when Skyrim came out. Like, the time between 2000, or between Oblivion and Skyrim was, what, 2006 to 2011. Todd Howard should have been out after the uh, Fallout 76 debacle. Like, when they fucked everybody over on, like, that merchant. If it was a Japanese company, he would have been. You saw him, how they canned uh, Ono after Street Fighter V debacle, dude. <laughs> And it's funny how they do that too. They don't just like outright fire people. Yeah, it's like a honor type thing, but also kind of like a also it's an honor type thing, but it's also kind of like an embarrassment thing almost. Like they keep demoting you <coughs> until yeah. you like resign. Like, yeah, not nah, but they I, demoted him way down, and then he resigned. Dude, just the idea though of like what what, what was it? The two things that they really it was the uh, the Fallout like sodas or what it, like the Nuka Colas. You were supposed to get like a Nuka Cola bottle. I can't remember if it was supposed to be. It's been so long, I can't remember what it was supposed to be. But it was supposed to be filled with soda, I believe. And then weren't there supposed to be like really nice canvas bags or something? Yeah, and they were shit. Yeah, that weren't what they the showed. Helmet ended up having, like one of the special helmets had some kind of weird chemical in it or something, making people sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some shit like that. Oh, hey man, you got the real experience. We fucking rem- we poisoned you like the earth that you would be on would poison you. You got rads, dude. You, you're gonna be a mutant. Ordered Tekken Eight and I was supposed to get these little like keychain of like yeah Kazuya's gloves or Jen's gloves or something, mm-hmm. and they hadn't come in at the same time, and I never went back and got them. I don't have my keychain. Oh, that sucks, Dick. I got mad not for anything, not for anything like in pre- like. Real serious, but I pre-ordered the Mario RPG remake because it was supposed to come with a little pin set, but I had to get it like a day. I didn't get a pin set. I re- pre-ordered I it. I pre-ordered it. To, did you get it the day of? Because I got it the day after because I couldn't get there for the premiere and they had handed out all the fucking pin sets. And I was specific. They should have made enough for all that's, the pre-orders. That's kind of what I'm saying, man. But I, I specifically wanted to get the pin sets for Amy because you know she like she likes that shit, and I frankly didn't give a fuck. But it would have been cool to have like a Malo and a Bowser. It wasn't even. It wasn't even mentioned to me. 
Oh, really? Yeah. That's the whole reason I did, dude, that's the whole reason I pre-ordered it. I had the money. I could have just walked in there with the fucking money. But I paid it off just to get the fucking pin set. And, like, dude, Nintendo's bad about their pre-order shit, too. Because it's always, like, pins or something stupid. Because I got Mario Wonder. You know you know what came with that for the pre-order? What? A fucking sticker set. I didn't get that either. Ah, oh, fuck, dude. I might have two. I might be able to give you some Mario stick. You want a fucking Mario elephant no, sticker, bro? I'm just I got saying, you. Like, I didn't. I didn't. I, it wasn't even mentioned. Man, GameStop's dropping the ball, dude. I was they don't ask- need to be dropping any more balls. No, nah, and I was asking about like I they're juggling the- all the most of the balls in their mouth right now. <laughs> yeah. I was asking about the pre-order stuff, dude. So every time. Yeah, I need to like. He oh, was supposed uh, to get a hold of me. Did you? Is- like they never told. They never got a hold of me about that. The pre-order stuff for Tekken. I They're still, probably all gone now. They probably like got rid of them because I never picked it up. Yeah. I, I've still got to play Tears of the Kingdom. I've had it forever. But I keep playing other games because I know once I get into Tears of the Kingdom, I'm, that's all I'm going to fucking do. Yeah. So it, it just worries. It was fun. It worries me. But did you get the pre-order thing for that? No, no, no. no. We <laughs> bought it after it came okay. out, I think. It's not great. It's just like a wooden fucking sign with like stupid writing on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, pre-orders. GameStop. Ah, dude, man. Some of them used to be cool. You remember... Uh, they used to, yeah. Justice League Heroes, the fucking Alex Ross art poster? Yeah. For the Justice... That was, that was fucking sick, dude. All those gays are over. Yeah, it Limited went. run. If you're going to get anything, limited run, like, I'll have to show you. I'm going to show you something. Before, Arkham before Asylum, run, but... too. I, I think I told you that. That was my biggest... Fu- Still to this day, that's my biggest fucking bitch. Is uh, I ordered Arkham As- pre-ordered Arkham Asylum because had the thing I've always wanted to do is like, we're going to give you a fucking replica Batarang. Oh. And it was supposed to be metal. It wasn't. It was yeah. plastic. It was fucking plastic, dude. I was so fucking mad. I was like... I wouldn't have fucking ordered this. I right, like, well, they changed the drawing us at the last minute because we couldn't be handing out. It's like, then you should have fucking told people. Like, I don't give a fuck. Because you couldn't give a metal battering out? Yeah, I guess. But, I, dude, I just wanted a metal battering because I, I swear to God, I was going to have that displayed. That was going to be home to anybody fucking. I didn't care. It could have been blunt metal. That bitch would have been sharpened, and I would have been waiting for somebody to come <laughs> into my house. <laughs> fuck you! <laughs> like, ready. And now, now I just got this fucking metal. The only thing that was cool about it the only thing that was cool about it for me, I thought, was like they had the little uh, leather-bound book that was supposed oh, to be yeah. like psychiatrist notes on the inmates. That was all right, but it ain't worth paying 40 fucking extra dollars. You know what would have been? A fucking metal battery. Yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't buy any of the special editions to any of the other ones. Oh, you get a little Batman statue. Fuck you. Where's my battering? Well, we're about out of time. That's a good way to end it. That's <laughs> yeah. a good place to end it. GameStop, get it together, man. You're yeah. already about to head out the door. At least, at least make it worthwhile until you're all gone. Next time. Bye. Fuck you, where's my battery? <laughs> where's my battery?